and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode 30. Uh, my guest today is Professor Susanna Siegel, and she is the Edgar Pierce Professor of Philosophy at Harvard University, and her research interests are in philosophy of mind, epistemology, and philosophy of language. And in this episode, we begin with discussing her uh, latest book, The Rationality of Perception, which was published in 2017. Uh, she has uh, another book prior to that that's called The Contents of Visual Experience, and she has a number of publications as well. I'll make sure to include uh, links to her uh, website and relevant social media in the description field. So join uh, Susanna and myself in this conversation where we discuss uh, perception and uh, problems and solutions with how perception uh, works or presents itself. And also we discuss uh, perception in a group format or in a uh, beyond individual format. So thank you so much for joining us and I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'd like to welcome Dr. Susanna Siegel to the IdeaCast interview series. I'm very grateful to have you here today, and um, I'm looking forward to discussing your book, Rationality of Perception. And so I suppose the best way to kick that off is to ask you uh, what prompted you or inspired you to write, the, write that book. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me on here, Justin. And here's the book, people who are watching the video, there's it's purple, um, called The Rationality of of perception. And, you know, I was interested in these cases. Um, I was interested in this story that that's actually apocryphal, probably not true, um, but it gets told a lot, actually, of all places in embryology textbooks. Mm -hmm. And the story is the story of um, people in the 17th century who, you know, hadn't quite yet figured out how human reproduction worked exactly. There are all sorts of theories about how it worked. And some of these theories, you can get a sort of small child to generate if you, you know, they start asking how, how does a person come to life, come into existence? Um, you know, is it like gardening where you plant a seed somewhere and if the soil is, is, is good, then the seed can grow. Um, and so there were theories that were, were like this um, and some of them were called, and these are very old theories, preformationist theories of how does life begin? And so according to preformationism, um, you know, there are just, in embryos, there are teeny little people, they're really, really small, but they are preformed, hence the name. And there were debates before people understood about fertilization. Um, pe people, you know, had debates about whether the, where were these little preformed figures? Were they in the sperm? So there were spermist preformationists. Um, were they in the egg? You know, to the extent that people even had those categories. So the apocryphal story is that shortly after the invention of microscopes, you have to imagine how amazing it was when they are first got to be microscopes because people could look at all sorts of things under the microscope. Finally, you could see this kind of deeper structure of reality than is visible to the, to the, plain, to the plain eye. And so they looked at sperm under the microscope and some people who believe preformationism who were spermist preformationists were like, I can see it. I can see it right here in the microscope, this scientific instrument. I can see these little embryos in the sperm cells. And the reason that this story um, gets into embryology textbooks, obviously, is because it's part of the history of um, theories of how there come to be embryos in the first place. But it's also an extremely interesting example of what people call theory-laden perception, or top-down effects on perception, sort of antecedent, in this case, theories that you have affecting what you see when you think you're just observing the world as it is. So the amazing thing about perception, which is always you know, made it such a compelling topic for me is that in perception, we seem to be just presented with the way things are. It's a, you know, we open our eyes and we think, oh, you know, these are things not that I made up or that I invented or that I put here, but that I am confronted with as things that have their own reality. Um, and so the interesting thing about these theory laden uh, cases of theory laden perception are that you have a kind of problem if you think that you're just looking at the world to confirm your theory, but actually what you're seeing is partly determined by what you already believe. Mm. So, you know, the preformationist, this possibly apocryphal, probably apocryphal preformationist, but just imagine him looking through the microscope like, I wish to see, I was right, I was right. It, I can see it right here. Um, here is the, here is this little embryo in the sperm cell. So I've gotten some evidence from my view. And 
you know, you could kind of think of the dangers involved in this type of circle where you start off with some hypothesis or something that you think may be true or something you hope is true or something you're afraid is true, um, something you want to be true. And if any of these states of fear or desire or suspicion or belief or credence or even knowledge, if any of those things can influence what you see when you then check, you, from your point of view, are going to seem to be getting more evidence for your fear or for your suspicion, in this case, for preformationism. But there's some sense of, from the observer's point of view, as we're here listening to the story, like, are you crazy? This is terrible evidence. Yeah. You are not <laughs> getting more evidence for your view. You right. only see this because you already think it. So this is actually a very poor way to improve what in philosophy we call your epistemic situation, a situation having to do with what you can know, what you have evidence for. So I wrote this book because I wanted to understand, um, I wanted to understand what happens in your perceptual experience when they when it, when it is affected in this way, and how does it affect our just ordinary epistemic situation? Like how often might this happen? That's an empirical question. But if it did happen, where would that leave our sort of ordinary experiences where like you open the fridge to see if there's mustard, and you're like, take ourselves, I take myself to know, and I do know whether there's mustard by looking in the fridge. I mean, I am quite sure that I can find out whether I have any mustard just by going in there and looking. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's always possible that, well, perhaps I'm in one of these situations like this preformationist was in, where like what I'm seeing is actually what I'm seeming to see is, is being influenced by the background of my, my mind, um, then what does that do to the power of my perceptual experience to give me reasons or evidence for what I should go on to believe? That was the problem that led me to write this book. And that's what the book's about. Okay. And so it sounds like the preformationist was dealing with almost some kind of naive uh, confirmation bias, right? There was this mm -hmm. feedback loop of belief or, or inference by way of a preloaded idea. And then that perpetuated this, aha, you know, I see what I see now. Um, yeah. And um, does this involve, uh, I hate to bring something way out of the blue, but so I'm a sort of naive realism versus representationalism, it seems like it would lean more into this perception. So in other words, we map, we naively, I think most people think they naively map um, perception one to one with reality and, um, or, or with the experience, I guess would be a better way to say it. So is that more of a representational problem or is it, uh, does that have anything to do with it? Because again, I'm 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 not uh, yeah. super keen well, on the right. whole topic, but yeah. So um, so there's a situation. Here's this thing that can happen. Um, your experience can be affected by your prior states of whatever sort. And then um, um, so what exactly is a philosophical problem here with this possibility? Um, well, as I was thinking of it, the problem is about what kind of powers our perceptual experiences have to give us justification or reasonable support for our beliefs that we form on the basis of those experiences. And so the situation is like, if you think about opening the fridge to check whether there's mustard, if I open the fridge and I see that there's mustard there, the way that I come to know there's mustard there is because I saw it, you know, it's from my experience. Mm -hmm. So my experience has this like epistemic power. It's like, you know, I get to reason to believe that the mustard's there, I know that it's there, because of this other thing, my experience. Um, so there it looks like experience is very powerful. But in the preformationism case, we kind of want to see the opposite. We want to be like, no, my experience, not very powerful at all. Even though if I'm the preformationist, it's going to seem to me exactly like checking in the fridge. I just checked under the microscope. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. It's like, well, can I, does my experience give me reason to believe my eyes? And the mustard sort of case looks like presses us to say yes. The preformationism case looks like it presses us to say no. And so if there's a difference between these cases, we have to identify what the difference is. And that's really the problem. Okay. So what steps do we take then to sort that out? Yeah. Well, um, um, well, one thing we do to try to sort it out is try to understand in the mustard case, what is it about the experience that is providing the epistemic power? Um, and here we come upon a debate in epistemology where some people say, you know, it doesn't really matter that your experience is part of your conscious life, that 
the fact that you had some perspective on your fridge is kind of nothing to do with it. It's just some state that's kind of reliable and part of a process that's reliable and that's that. Um, and I've found that position as many people have kind of unsatisfying. I'm much more drawn to the position that says, no, no, it really is like, you know, part of your consciousness, the conscious character of your experience, like you seeing it right there. You can see where it is in relation to you. You see what it looks like. I can point it out to somebody else. I can do all these things, which I seem to do as a result of, you know, the, the actual character of my experience. Um, now, but leaning in, but leaning toward that option runs us straight into problems with the preformationist because the preformationist also has a very vivid experience with a specific character mm. and so on. And so like, if it's the kind of first person point of view that we have in our experience that was actually providing the epistemic power in the mustard case, but that exact same thing is present in the preformationism case, right. we right. have to say something else about what the difference is. And so that's what that's why this book is more than ten pages long, um, <laughs> is because there's a lot to say. Yeah, I argue about what that is. I'd like to kind of have it in some way both ways. I think that there is some sort of um, I call it the phenomenal character of experience. That's what people call it. This uh, the, the the character of your experience that's you you that it has. What is it like to have the experience? Is your phenomenal character? If you think that the phenomenal character of experience is, of course something that the preformationist has an experience of the phenomenal character when he seems to see an embryo in the sperm cell. And then I have an experience of my different phenomenal character when I, when I look at the, the mustard. Um, but if it's the phenomenal character in each case that is bestowing some epistemic power, how come or how can we say, we either have to say that the preformationist, yeah, you know, does, does get some evidence for preformationism from this experience, which seems silly to me and like the wrong result, um, or we have to say that something else is happening in this other case. So my solution, I have a solution to that problem that takes up you know, some of the book, but I'm happy to talk through some of it. Um, okay. I mean, I can give you, I don't know, I'll let you. Uh, well, would it be worth bringing in the uh, Jack and Jill example too, or should we keep on with the preformationist yeah. and the mustard? No. Because that seems like that would add some, add some yeah, more so context it's always to good this. to multiply examples so people have a lot of examples okay. in their minds. So, so Jack and Jill, they have a complicated relationship. And um, Jill at one point is kind of worried. She's not sure, but she kind of worried. She's afraid that he's mad at her. And so then she sees him. And when she looks at him, she's like, oh my God, he looks really angry. Um, but what's happening to her is like what has happened to the preformationist and that her fear that he's angry is influencing how he looks when she sees him, how he looks to her. In other words, it's influencing the phenomenal character of her experience. Whereas if you saw Jack, you'd be like, he just looks kind of neutral, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the way he, he is one way, but the way he looks to you and the way he looks to her is different. And it's different because her experience being affected by her fear, your experience isn't. And um, so then she sees him and now she's like, oh God, I knew it, you know? Um, and now we can ask, well, Jill, does she get some more evidence, you know, from her experience? than she had before she saw him. Um, and then I kind of like to say, no, she doesn't because, you know, it's affected by her fear. Her mm. fear is doing something to experience that saps it. It saps it of the epistemic power it might otherwise have. And that sapping is what I call downgrade. It gets an epistemic downgrade. The okay. experience would have been epistemically more powerful if it hadn't been influenced in that way by her fear, or by the preformationist's outlook. Um, but when it is affected by that, what's happening is that this phenomenal thing, which you could have in some other circumstance, the exact same phenomenal thing and have it retain its full epistemic power, like if you really did look angry, um, you know, in the Jill case, it has less epistemic power. I call that epistemic downgrade. Okay. Her experience has been hijacked. It's been taken over by her fear. Her fear has had this undue influence on steering her mind in response to the experience, steering the epistemic power of the experience. So it's hijacking, we hijack a plane. Oh. So um, the so Jill's experience, the preformationist experience, these have been hijacked by their prior states. And that's why the phenomenal character is a thing that can be epistemically very powerful, but if it gets hijacked, it gets an epistemic downgrade. And that is my story about perceptual justification. Okay, so how do we rescue uh, epistemic uh, 
value in this, um, as you were saying prior to Jack and Jill, that you do have a solution in the book or you do have a proposal, a thesis that uh, can can sort this out for, for epistemic uh, validity mm -hmm. or... <laughs> Yeah. So, um, okay. Now here we're getting into the the nitty gritty, the, um, the 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 dirty details. You know, we're deep in the weeds, as they say, down <laughs> the rabbit hole. Um, but in epistemology, what analytic epistemologists in the Anglo American tradition have assumed is that when you ask about whether you know your beliefs say are justified or unjustified, are they evidentially well supported or not, and if it turns out that you know, your belief is like, you know, it's based on poor evidence or, or you just jump to a conclusion or something like that. Yeah. Then we say that the belief is unjustified and we say the belief is irrational. We say you're irrational for having this crappy belief. That's what we yeah. say. But traditionally in this tradition of philosophy, and of course there's many traditions of philosophy, but this is the one I was formed in. In this tradition of philosophy, what has been standard to say about experience, perceptual experience, is that it's just kind of off the grid of that kind of evaluation. Your experiences, it's been said, are not the kinds of things that can make you rational or irrational, only your responses to your experience. And I'm questioning that in this book. I'm saying, actually, if you look at experiences that are formed by these upstream states, you know, the preformationism, you know, that you believe, you know, that you're, that you're believing before you look in the microscope then affects your experience. I'm holding that actually your experience is more like belief than we have acknowledged in this tradition in that it really can itself be epistemically better or worse. It can be epistemically, it's not just that it could be epistemically more or less powerful, which is what I was talking about with downgrade, but it can actually get, it has its own epistemic status, which I call epistemic charge. So you could have positive charge, negative charge. Um, and then on my picture, what's happening really is your experiences just by virtue of their phenomenal character are starting off with what I call a positive charge, an analogy with electric charge. So positive charge, meaning it has the epistemic status, it's good. But then this charge, again, like an electric charge, it can be modified, it can be qualified, it can be increased or decreased. Um, and when it's influenced, and because your experience is hijacked, if it's influenced by an irrational fear or by an unconfirmed hypothesis, then the epistemic charge can turn negative. Have, um, um, so the, on this picture then, your experience can reflect your rational standing, not just your beliefs, but even your experiences can. And the reason this is important, I mean, I'm, I am a geek, newsflash. Um, you know, I am a geek who studied epistemology. So, you know, I'm sort of interested in systematic theories of things and figuring out if you say this, how does it affect that? And that's kind of part of what philosophers do. But I'm not just an epistemic geek. I am also um, interested in politics and the role of the mind in politics and in the legal system. And if you look at, um, if you look at uh, self-defense law, um, in self-defense law, in a very interesting corner of the law because it's a place where actions and behaviors that normally would be completely not okay, aggression, attack, violence, various sorts, become okay if you're doing it in self-defense. And it seems like there should be such a thing as self-defense law because you should be able to defend yourself if you're attacked. Um, that much seems fine. But the crucial, crucial question in, ap in applying the self-defense law is, well, when and how do we decide on what principles do we use to decide whether your violence that you're doing has this status of exonerating you or not? Mm -hmm. And the reason that I was so interested in this question about top-down effects on perception or cognitive penetrability is sometimes called is because I was writing this at a time when you know, a certain type of killing, um, which had been going on a very long time in the US, suddenly became a political issue. And these are the sorts of killings where um, people, sometimes police officers, sometimes not, would claim that they were really afraid for their lives. And fear is a sort of central affect and emotion in self-defense law. In the courtroom, if you show that somebody is reasonably afraid, reasonably afraid for their life, that they are experiencing, you know, having an experience in which a reasonable person would be afraid, then it's much easier to exonerate them if they, if they exert violence on somebody, if they kill somebody even. Um, 
So that's really interesting because if we shift from embryos and mustard to social perception, then we can look at cases where somebody might be a boy on a playground with a toy gun, but because of somebody, the perceivers prejudiced theory that they're walking around with, um, their exaggerated sense of the proximity this person has to them, their background beliefs, which maybe it's been part of their own police training, that they are in a really, really, really dangerous situation. And so anything that might be dangerous is sort of probably dangerous. Um, we get exactly the situation I've been writing about. We get a situation where, you know, and you, where they might say, oh my God, there's this 20 year old with a gun, you know, mm -hmm. and really it's actually a 14 year old with a toy gun, you know, or you might get a situation where there's someone who's, you know, overpowered by a police force and, you know, has stolen a little cigarillo, but actually is like described as, 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 um, Darren Wilson described Michael Brown and Ferguson in the famous case, um, that really started the publicity around the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for Black Lives, you know, they said, well, he looked like a giant, you know, he looked like he was going to kill me, you know, so, and like <clears throat> the people, there's all, you know, very complex what happens in a, in a courtroom and what somebody says, says in their defense, there's no, not always a direct line from, you know, a narrative that say a prosecutor um, might, might spin about how somebody who exerted lethal force acted and what they actually felt in their mind. But if we just abstract from that and say, well, just how could, like, could it have been? Could it have been that any of these officers in these two cases I'm alluding to, um, you know, Tra Trayvon Martin or, or, or Michael Brown as victims of lethal, lethal violence that's then exonerated on grounds of self-defense, if it could be that in their minds, it, they were afraid and they were afraid because of the way it looked and the way it looked was like, looked really scary, mm -hmm. you know? Let's just grant all of that, grant all of that. Um, it's a deep question about how you apply self-defense law if you should apply it in ways that just starts with the experience no matter how they got it. And my point is that that's not gotta, that's gotta be the wrong way to apply self-defense law. If these conclusions about epistemology are correct that I'm drawing about most rudim embryos, you know, then, then all experiences are not created epistemically equal. Mm -hmm. the, the epistemic power of the experience and how reasonable you are in having your experience is very sensitive to how your experience might arise in your mind. And if it's arising in your mind from a paradigmatically unreasonable state like prejudice um, or like unconfirmed hypothesis, then um, your experience is not reasonable. So we should not ask when we apply the reasonable person standard, what would anybody reasonable with this experience, with this experience conclude, we should ask, um, how would anybody who came to this experience in the way this person came to it, what would they conclude? Um, and you get totally different answers if you, depending on which question you ask. And as you mentioned in the book, um, uh, epistemic charge is a relationship between experience and psychology or psychological processes. So as you said, uh, a, a prejudice or, or perhaps a phobic uh, predisposition or something like that uh, would, would certainly um, do it do a downgrade process there um so has this been considered uh, in litigation has this shown up that you know of in any cases um and beyond even these really larger cases do you know of any any evidence where um uh say the uh the state i guess going after or whoever it is that's bringing if it's a civil case or if it's the state bringing forward a case that what you're talking about is considered at all. Like, you know, was this a rational move? Yes, they did fear for their lives, but in the, uh, you know, the next step forward thinking, was this a rational move? Is that showing up at all? Or do you think it will ever show up? Well, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of problems with writing self-defense law anyways. Um, and one of the things about the movement for black lives is that's really brought into focus some of those problems. Um, and, and you know it's really useful to so 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 um, I actually do know of a group of people. My my colleague Caroline Light has taught me a lot about self defense law. She's an historian um, and author of a great book called Stand Your Ground, um, which is about the history of of lethal self defense in the United States. Um, she is part of a group that's working on you know uh, trying to trying to redraft uh, what self defense standards look like. And in, in their case, they're, they're concerned with the kind of temporal scope of the thing. So, so like, right, as it stands, you have to, 
you have to reasonably believe or reasonably fear that you're in immediate danger. Mm-hmm. It's got to be immediate. And the thing about these cases that that um, were very much on my mind when I was um, thinking through the epistemology stuff and writing the rationality perception is that they're cases of, between strangers or people who don't know each other, never seen each other, and actually never see each other again. Um, so it's really just, and, and things like that, when you see someone, you encounter someone who walks in an elevator or you're standing in line at the ATM machine, you are relating to them. Maybe one of you is a police officer, in which case you're relating to them of a different dimension. But, but even if one is a police officer, whether or not they are, you know, these are just two people who do not know each other. Mm-hmm. So that means that your assessment of the situation is drawing exclusively on the combination of the input you're getting right then and there and your background beliefs about it, which is very, very different from another type of case where you would think self-defense defenses are very frequent, which is about intimate partner violence. So in the case of people who are abused by their partners, say women abused by their partners, are were victims of sex trafficking, you know, these are cases where people know each other. You know, these are cases where it's sort of, you know, it's not like two strangers who are trying to figure out, oh my God, are we, is our proximity such that, you know, there is some danger here, but this is like a lot of proximity. I know this man has abused me. I know he has kidnapped me, you know? And so this is a sort of paradigm case you might think where like, okay, much easier to reach a reasonable belief about whether I'm in danger because I've been in danger, mm-hmm. you know? I know him, I yeah. know what he has done and what he plans to do. After all, I'm kidnapped, right? But, but what happens in a lot of the cases of victims of sex trafficking, um, for example, who do try to get free in some way, um, like using violence, using, um, is that sometimes they'll like, um, you know, attack the man when he's asleep because that's when they can overpower him. But then the self-defense law says like, well, he was asleep. You weren't in immediate danger because the guy's asleep, you know? So, um, so that just seems like a problem with the law when you think about the, just the type of case that you would, that self-defense law should, should be useful for mm-hmm. getting people, um, you know, for, for exonerating when exonerating violence when exonerations needed. Um, and that's just a problem with the way it's written. It was written about, it's written with the wrong temporal scale, it looks like, or too restrictive a temporal scale. Um, and so it's sort of like the polar opposite of the case where you're just drawing on what we call your priors mm-hmm. about the situation. Or anyway, you're just drawing on your priors that aren't, uh, you're, you're drawing on your priors that were formed, you know, before you even saw the person, you know, versus you're drawing on your priors that are informed by your past experiences with the person, so sort of, you know, to put it in some lingo, de re priors versus de dicto priors. Mm-hmm. De dicto meaning it's very general. It's not about the specific person. It's just like, um, you know, I'm seeing... I'm seeing an American of African descent. And if I am saddled with this, you know, racist prejudice, then I'm gonna jump to the conclusion that they're dangerous. Um, but but in the in the sex trafficking sort of example, you know, I have some priors about this guy that are, you know, because I know him. He is my abuser, he is my kidnap. Um, so that's de re, meaning it's specific about this guy, mm-hmm. which you might think is epistemically way more better grounds for believing it. But actually people in the sex trafficking situation, and there's this great website called survivedandpunished.org, which I learned mm. about from the philosopher Ayanna Spencer, a UConn, this wonderful philosopher. And um, she, so, you know, this website is full of cases of um, victims of sex trafficking who, you know, have tried to fight back and have not been exonerated on grounds of self-defense. It's very, very rare. Um, it's m- way more rare than it is in the sort of like, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse or Michael Brown, or George Zimmerman, sorts of cases where you see acquittals on the grounds of self-defense on the ground of two people who've never seen each other, you know, um, one is getting acquitted for lethal force on the basis of being reasonably afraid. So it's very interesting to compare what's happening in these, in these cases. And it really shows the need to, um, it really shows the need to both rewrite, you know, the, what, refine what the self-defense um, defense can look like um, but also re- um, to think about why is it there's this different, how, how is this law going to play out when there's just such a difference in kind of prior credibility given, um, you know, to the, so much more credibility given to what, you know, the, these police officers say they felt um, and versus what the often young women, often young women of color say they felt. Um, yeah.
Yeah, it, it seems damning to the uh, the person that we're talking about that's been in the uh, sex trafficking or, or trauma bonding prisoner relationship and that no matter what they do, it'll be considered premeditated. There could be a spontaneous mm -hmm. fight between the two people in a crowded area with witnesses. She happens right. to have a knife or a, a weapon on her and boom. And but I would suspect then that she would have the burden of, of proof would be that it wasn't something premeditated because they were in a relationship. So that is mm -hmm. troubling to know that right. it's the same scenario. There's a there's a confrontation in public. He's threatening or they're fr threatening. And uh, mm -hmm. the other person responds with uh, what would otherwise be considered appropriate action or mm -hmm. violence. So yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, yeah. so so uh, obviously there's an awareness of this and uh, is there advocacy for this change in the law? Do you know of anything uh, happening on that? Well, there's I, I just know of this one working group um, via my, my colleague, Professor Light. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. There, sh there should be, obviously there really should be. And, mm. and um, you need to sort of look at these contrasts to see, to really feel the force of why there, there should be. Then of course there are problems about, you know, um, well, well there's, there's been a lot of police reform around, um, you know, how easy it is to, to question um, or even prosecute a police officer in situations like this. So of course, that's up and up and running and highly debated about mm -hmm. about what to do. And there we leave the realm of like, you know, anything I could potentially help with, given my expertise. My expertise doesn't bear on that. You know, my expertise bears on the relationship between your experience and reasonableness, mm -hmm. and how to even apply the reasonable person person standards. And one thing that's difficult about applying the reasonable person standards in the way I think they should be applied, where you don't just hold constant the experience, but you have to look at how the experience is caused, is we don't often know how the experience is caused. And it's very hard to kind of look into someone's mind and find out how it is caused, which is why, you know, I haven't done that much more with that interface between the rationality perception and reason and, and the law, because I've never quite been able to figure out, and I don't think, and there's so many problems with self-defense law and how, how it should look. I, don't, I, don't, I think it's a great area for research. What should self-defense look like? law look like. I, I have part of an answer to what it should look like in, in just this one constraint, but how to apply that constraint is very hard because mm -hmm. in any given case, you know, I don't know how are you supposed to find out whether your experience was more like the preformationist, you know, or not. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of hard to know. I mean, you can, you can guess about it and I think it should definitely be raised as a salient possibility, but that's as kind of as much as you could, that's as much as you could do. Maybe that's, you know, maybe, maybe that is something. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think with with regard to the police, and I don't know, I have all the respect in the world for for um, competent policing. Me uh, too. Uh, yes, and uh, but you know, there's there's union protection, which I think um, in cases like this, uh, that could be something that could be examined. I don't know, uh, you know, yeah. the, given given what's happened to unions in general in this country, I would think that they could, pre, you know, they could handle a little scrutiny in that regard because they are insulated mm -hmm. from that end. And also, uh, mm -hmm. I love what uh, Noam Chomsky was asked about defunding the police last year or the year before. And he goes, you know how you defund the police? He said, you just pay them more money. And so I think he, and he didn't go much further than that, but I think he was alluding to the idea that you need educated professional uh, people involved. And there are good educated professional uh, police officers out there. But I think yeah. the standard could be that you have at least a bachelor's degree in, in criminology and some psychology, you know, a BS in, at least in psychology, just to be a street level, uh, entry level police officer. And that uh, it's not practical because budgets are budgets and so forth. But I, I would love to see police officers are very, very well paid, well educated, well informed, but also have uh, some exposure to uh, to um, psychology and and knowing, uh, you know, about themselves, right? About their psyche, not just the psyche of the yeah. of the criminal, but also their own psyche and what they're what we're all predisposed to, especially when we're fearful, yeah. right? So yeah, I think I mean there are these debates about whether it's sort of a personal individual predisposition to fear. So you know, is that the problem? And I tend to think that isn't really the problem because there's there's lots of great work done on police training. You know, and um, I, I like there there was for this sort of brief time, a, a whole spate of research on kind of visual bias in policing and they lots of experiments done with police officers. Or are they more likely to mistake a you know, tool for a gun or whatever? Mm. And, you know, but I, I really don't think that's the problem. It's not I don't think we should look in their minds. I think we should look at police training. So actually, the, um, you know, the, the, the I wrote an op ed with Professor Light on the, what's called the warrior mindset. Mm. Um, and in, in police training. So we were talking about 
the framework that's sometimes called the sheepdog framework. Sheepdog framework is like, you know, uh, it's almost like a theory of the social world, a theory of the social world that, that, that many police are taught that this is the world they are in, at least for the communities that they're policing. Um, you know, look, it's, there are a lot of wolves and you got to protect the innocent sheep. But the wolves are like out to get the sheep and you are stepping into a situation in which you have to be a sheepdog. You have to be the person who's like attacking the wolves to protect the sheep. So here's a sort of like little animal story, you know, but but who are the wolves mm. and how are you supposed to recognize the wolves for a wolf? Or what if you make a mistake? And um, and, you know, is this and like it, it's a it's a narrative full of it's a narrative with absolutes. That's the thing about animals. You know, like because you can say because they're animals, like they just do their instinctive thing, mm. and so the wolves do their instinctive thing, and the sheep do their instinctive thing, and so you sheep die. Everybody's got their very clear role. There's no room for for nuance, ambiguity, or second thoughts, or second feelings, or anything. Um, and they're taught you have to just respond immediately because it's the wolf, because it's the wolf. You mm. know, and that's and it's that training. You know, with that kind of training, that's the sort of training that's going to set you up to have these hijacked experiences. You know, um, and that's the training. It's like these are people doing what they're trained to do. So, mm -hmm. as in other cases of this, you know, you sort of like you. I don't think it's like a, a, an individual just was sort of born a certain way and you know wandered into the police officer, you know, police academy. You know, that's not what happens. It's like very carefully selected trainings. And there's lots of research people can find. You search like warrior mindset police training um, that that are. Uh, you know, paints the world. And, you know, if you're going to train people to be, if you're going to train people to have this warrior mindset and you're going to give them examples of what do the wolves look like, you know, um, one high school, group of high school kids from actually it was high school because so, so few local newspapers are funded anymore, but high school papers are often funded. And so, and I think I can't remember if it's Lexington or, or um, Louisville, Kentucky, but one of those two cities in Kentucky, um, the manual red eye newspaper, high school newspaper, a couple of kids, um, you know, probed the police training that had been shown to the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor, which happened in Kentucky, and found that they were doing warrior warrior mindset training. They had quotes, they actually had quotes from, you know, Nazi thing. I mean, it was very disturbing. Mm. Um, so, you know, that it's that kind of culture. If, if you have that culture and training, it's just zero surprise that, that, that you'll find this kind of policing, which treats the life <clears throat> of some Americans as very cheap very mm. cheap um mm. and and that, that's so now we've left psychology we've left epistemology we've left self-defense law we have a kind of different institutional way more makes more way more sense why policing looks like this if this is how it's trained and many of the you know many of the protests about you know to, to reform policing in some way you know has focused on this training and rightfully so rightfully so and that's just orthogonal to funding or not funding you know um it's just orthogonal to that I, I don't see, I, I'm not a pacifist. I don't see how there could be life without self-defense law. I don't see how there could be life without police. Yeah. Um, I do think we should have some form of police, um, yeah. but what their role is, I think, you know, what exactly the role should be, what principles should guide that institution. Um, you know, that, that, that's, um, that's an important question for, for political philosophy, for political theory, for policy work. Um, sure. And, sure. you know, what, how should you be trained? What should the role, what just fundamentally is the role of the police? Yeah. I think those are super important, super important questions. And, you know, all the, the stuff about perception and self-defense law, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, and I, I know something about those things from my work, but, but, you know, when I look at the problem as a whole, you know, I haven't like zoomed in to be like, I can fix this if we just, because <laughs> I feel like, well, you know, I see it's kind of a systemic problem. The, the solutions I think kind of mainly are going to lie more at this level of like, what are the police for? What kind of training should they have? Um, and, you know, that's above my pay grade and beyond my wheelhouse. But I think that's where the questions really, really are. So that's why this book, which I love, I love my book. I do love my book. I think it's got a lot of good points in it, but this book is not going to solve the pleasing problems is not, um, no, no, you know, other things no. going to solve that. No, but if it gets enough people thinking uh, about how, again, how we interact with our environment and our co-inhabitants of our, our higher sentient co-inhabitants right. of the environment, it's going to help. I mean, especially, you know, there's consensus there's, and, and we can get to some consensus thinking or, or group thinking in a, in a few minutes, but, uh, and, and again, I, I'm 
I could be completely naive, but like I said, I think we give so much emotional esteem to uh, policing and the persons, women and men who uh, who literally put their lives on the line to to defend us and protect us. And so I'm with you in that yeah. it's it's necessary until we get to utopia. Uh, we need that. And but uh, like I, uh, we can back up that emotional uh, cheerleading and that back the blue kind of mentality with higher pay grades and um, maybe different. Uh, ways, like you said, of bringing them into their profession uh, so that they are equipped and supported in a way that's ho more holistic uh, beyond just the warrior mindset. I mean, you, you need it, and yeah. minus the, the Nazi propaganda, but, you know, sprinkling of that, a, a creole of, of, or a synthesis of other uh, systems and ideas that can make them comprehensively functional or functional in that sense that they have that comp comprehensive matrix going on there. So yeah, I agree. And um, where was I going to go from there? I think I just derailed myself. So, but yeah, I, 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 it would be nice if we could do more. It, it, it reminds me of during the Gulf War, we had a lot of bumper stickers and, and people were sort of feeling a knee jerk um, uh, empathy for what happened to Vietnam veterans. And so we were all very careful about how we treated the uh, people who were serving yeah. in Iraq, the women and the men in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. And and so, like I said, yeah. that that kind of sentiment, I also think, you know, well, what can we do? Because now there are a lot of PTSD suffering veterans out there who oh, yeah. aren't getting any love and support. The stickers didn't do much good for that. So, like I said, I'm tying that yeah. in. It's a little bit polemical, but I'm just tying it into what we can do for police in the future. No, I uh, agree. To, I mean, like, yeah, I, I, anyone who anyone who's sort of in the in the, in the in a dangerous in a dangerous profession deserves the you know support of everybody else in the in the in the society and yeah. people who are in a profession where they're being told to do awful things you know deserve support and sympathy for being told to do an awful thing you yeah. know um, so it's not uh, it, it's not you know we have to target I mean of course if, you know if if I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm white. I'm not mistakable. I, I am white. I look white, you know, mm -hmm. so, and I'm female and I look female. So if I need help, you know, I am sort of the paradigmatic helpable person, yeah. you know, from the point of view of the police. Like I, you know, if, if I'm stopped by police, I'm not, my initial reaction is not fear. <laughs> if mm -hmm. I need something, it might occur to me to like, oh, ask a police officer. But I know that my friends who, you know, are, are not white and female, you know, um, and who are not white and male do not feel this way and should not feel that way. And if I were them, I wouldn't feel that way either. And when I'm with them, you know, I, I don't suggest that we perhaps ask the police officer, you know, so that's, just, <laughs> yeah. that's very amazing. That's actually an amazingly, it creates an instant, an instant experiential gulf um, between us and just what I would call the social affordances of the situation. What kind of interactions do you think are possible? Which ones are threatening? Which ones, you know, are you just going to do maybe everything you can to avoid? <laughs> um, so that's huge difference. That's a huge, huge difference um, in just your, your, your sense of yourself in public space and sense of who might be there to help you versus to hurt you. And when one of the same figure, you know, some of the population is like, this is a fundamentally helpful figure and the other is a fundamentally potentially harmful figure you know that's a huge that's a huge difference a huge problem too it's a huge mm -hmm. problem to have people kind of sharing a society but who have such opposite attitudes so it's yeah. like you know it's a little bit easier for me given my initial starting position to you know I run a lot of races and I'm always like thank you officer you know I mean I'm you know sort of like you know these friendly little micro interactions with the officer but I recognize that that's sort of you know, I, I'm coming from a more of a starting point. I mean, like if I, yeah. if I was coming from a different starting point, it might be like, well, you know, I might even be afraid to do that. And, you know, I might be like, well, I don't want to call attention to myself. You know, I just have a completely different, you know, I might have a completely different kind of set of, set of experiences. I think it's important to, to remember that because, you know, I'm very interested in how we <clears throat> perceive each other and should relate to one another and, you know, of, to people who we don't know, but who we are sharing society with. Sometimes we see them like standing in line at the ATM machine, you know, and sometimes we don't see them, but we know about them. We know that there's a certain death rate from COVID. We know that, um, you know, there's an unemployment rate or a labor shortage or whatever. And so what is the right, this is a question you discussed very usefully by Aristotle and, and other people, you know, what, what kind of relationship should I stand into what I call my co politizens you know, mm -hmm. what kind of concern should I have for them? Obviously I don't know them, you know, people call it civic friendship, but it's a very poor term because 
I might not know them. You know, and even if I see them, I still not my friend. It's not friendship. It's not friendship, but it is something. And it should be a locus of concern. It shouldn't be a locus of fear. It shouldn't be a locus of distrust. It shouldn't be a locus of suspicion. If it is a locus of any of those things and is reasonably a locus of any of those things, something else has gone wrong in the surrounding um, that we have to think about how to correct. Amen. And mentioning politizens, uh, do you want to move on to percept? Actually, I have a one question that's that's tied back into the book, and then moving on to uh, to populations and um, what defines a public and a crowd and things like that. And we could maybe talk yeah. about that a little bit. But let me ask one question. Uh, in in having read the book, and 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 as I said to you before we hit record, it as a lay person, as somebody with no education, it was, it was, a, yeah, it was a good challenge of a good brain jog. Um, it was not uh, obscurantist and crazy okay. like Hegel or, or even Whitehead. Okay. I've, tried to, I've tried to read Whitehead. It was perfectly yeah. legible and understandable. It's just, you know, there's logic That's involved in that. So you have to, I have to yeah. slow down. <laughs> I think, okay, yeah. what did she mean there? But anyway, so my question is, uh, again, it's very naive. Um, self-perception and you know is the same process in so i have this perception of it's, this is fictional but i have this perception of myself that uh you know i'm uh, very popular in my neighborhood and everybody adores me and so that's basically the right. same thing like i i project back onto right. myself this this persona or whatever you want to call it that's kind of the same mm -hmm. mechanics of what you're addressing right yeah that's a good point so um I, yeah i can walk around thinking that i am really especially you know funny and attractive, you know, yeah. and everyone thinks they're kind of better than average, you know, this is yeah, the right. so on. except the depressive people, they get it right about themselves. Yeah, they're honest, at least. Oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's, there's two things in here in this area. One is that you're absolutely right that my beliefs about myself can be influenced by what I hope is true or what I fear is true. You could have, you know, when this happens a lot, um, I have this character Vivek who, you know, thinks mm. he's really the gem. Um, but the interesting thing about Vivek, and this is my second point about self-perceptions, is that you you can often um, find that your self-perceptions affect your other perceptions in that you project the way like Vivek is standing for the audience. And yeah, I, I have Vivek going through a little arc of transformation. So at the beginning, <laughs> Vivek was like, oh, I'm not sure I can do it. You know, and he was like, oh my God, everybody's looking so judgmental at me, you know? And then Vivek's like, yeah, you know, actually I am the jam, I am the greatest. And then everyone looks like, right, please. So it's like the same people, you know, the same faces, but they look differently to Vivek, depending on his, exactly as you said, his self-perceptions, you know? So it's like, how does the world show up to him as a function of what he believes about himself? Mm -hmm. um, so his, what he believes about himself, you know, can be influenced and, in, you know, by other things he believes or feels about himself. What there isn't exactly in the self-perception case is not a clear analog of the perceptual experience, this kind of mediating thing. You know, um, uh, there is, you sort of seem to go straight to belief or suspicion, or of course there's lots of feelings. You could be afraid that you're a certain way, or you can hope that you're a certain way, and whatever. But I think interestingly, and this is, you know, for any fiction writers listening, you know, of course, this is how you portray in fiction, the way you portray what someone thinks about themselves is you portray how the world shows up to them as a function mm. of what they think. So Vivek is like a little micro example of this. So Vivek is very overconfident. That's a self-directed thing. Then that's manifests in a perception of the crowd. Like the crowd looks a certain way to, to in a way that's congruent with his overconfidence. Okay, okay. I'm glad we could address, I'm glad we could bring uh, Vivek into the fold since we had the preformationists and Jack and Jill. <laughs> we can close out the yeah, book. Yeah, so I have a one cool thing about this book, if I could say so myself, yeah. is that there is an index of examples, and even uh, just reading this index all by itself gives there's three indices: there's index of names, index of subjects, <clears throat> index of examples. So we have index of examples: Kara, right. the nine-year-old car driver. We have the war-weary soldier. We have um, the banana behind a curtain. Ah. We have Pierre, not in a cafe. Um, we have pepperoni. There's there's a case of pepperoni. So you could you could look up, you could just look up any of these examples. There's a lot of examples. I like to do philosophy with lots of examples because when I read philosophy, that's the part that I always remember is you know the example. Who can remember some big abstract like principle or biconditional or whatever? You know, I remember like the scenario. Mm -hmm. So I figured like um, I illustrate things via hopefully vivid scenarios in the book, like Vivek and Vivek and Jack and Jill and preformationism. 
And those are the things I remember. So I thought if someone's reading this book and they're trying to sort things out and work things through, they might just say, well, where was that example? Right, so that's why I right. Examples. I'm the kind, I have the kind of mind that um, uh, anecdotes or these examples are great heuristics for me. Then I can draw uh, analogies quickly that way and then go back to look at the technical parts and then use them to, uh, to bridge things. And so, yeah, your, your use of that is, is powerful and important. And so uh, before we move on, I do, you know, shameless cheap plug this book. Uh, if you're uh, a student of psychology, uh, especially maybe now we're going to talk about larger populations, uh, social psychology or uh, you know, in, in philosophy of mind, uh, epistemology, obviously, but uh, I think uh, if you are uh, intellectually curious, uh, this is a great book, and um, it's, uh, it's, 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 as I like to say, it's apprehendable, but it was a challenge for me because I have no background, uh, so I had to go in it kind of cold, and, but I still managed, and um, because I'm curious, <laughs> I'm always, and I have an obsessive personality. If I don't figure something out, I'll, thank God for Google, right? Like, you and I are probably close in age. <laughs> 30 years ago, we didn't have Google. We had to go, go to the library and get the yeah. books out. Oh my God, I, I can't even imagine now. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so Google dependent. I'm like, oh, I'll just look it up. Yeah. And I can remember my mother when I was look a kid, go look yeah. it up, you know? But she meant the dictionary or the, <laughs> the, the old paper encyclopedias. So, so here's to, uh, yeah. for, for its shadow and its light, here's to, to search engines. Yeah. So can we talk about yeah. uh, groups? Um, let me see what time it is. I want to make sure you are good with time here. Oh, okay. So, We're good. Uh, We're Oh, okay. All right. Good. You just give me a wink when it's time to uh, start wrapping it up. So uh, group, uh, so when we scale up perception to more than just one individual, how do, how do things uh, move forward that way when we go into groups uh, with perception? Oh, yeah. so one, one metaphor I always use yeah. for humans is stigmergy, right? So that like we talk about large groups moving, especially spontaneously. I always think of the murmurations of birds and fish and things like that. It's just a metaphor, but it really has close uh, correspondence or correlation sometimes, I think. Anyway, I'm sorry. That, that's just my, my way of uh, helping to uh, understand us a little bit. So groups. Yeah, yeah so it's a, a great question of, um, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is, can you perceive the public? So the public in the sense of the, the body politic, the, the group of people who you're all kind of being governed by. Um, we're all being governed by, we're all subject to the same laws, although as we were discussing before, not always in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, not always protected by the same laws in the same way that we should be. Um, but nonetheless, we are co politicians We are living in this, sharing a political society together. And um, that doesn't mean we like each other. You know, it doesn't mean we know each other. It doesn't mean we agree with each other, but, but we are sharing the polity. And so we are co politicians And there's all sorts of interesting questions you could ask about the relationship, the co politicianship relationship. Um, like moral questions of what should your concern be like? What is the ground of that concern? Um, you know, in what way are we interdependent and things like that. But in terms of perception, yeah, can you perceive the polity? So this might seem like, no, it's too big. Hmm. You, you know, you can't perceive it as too big. But actually, um, you know, it's been assumed that you have to imagine the polity. So um, this political theorist, Benedict Anderson in the 80s wrote a book called Imagined Communities where he defined a nation as a community that's imagined as limited and sovereign, it's imagined in the sense that you know most people don't will never meet each other, but in our minds lives the image of our communion, as he puts it. Mm. So it's just been assumed that the way you get your mind around the public, it's one thing to have a concept of the public, the American public, if you're living in the US. But it's another thing to kind of actually feel the force of the public, you know, to actually get your mind around it in a way that's not just this kind of abstraction, but something that you are in and that connects you to other people um, who you might have any number of different attitudes toward, like we were talking about before. Um, and uh, so I've been interested in whether it's possible to perceive a public. Um, and obviously you can't just kind of behold all the members of the public at once because there's too many, not to mention some of them aren't born yet and some of them have already died. Um, but we know that you don't have to perceive a whole thing by perceiving all the parts of it. Um, and the extremely simple example of this is um, philosophers, for some reason, like to talk about tomatoes. So <laughs> tomato, you can see a tomato without seeing the backside of a tomato, you know, so you can see the tomato by seeing just part of the tomato. So perhaps you could see the public or, you know, by seeing part of the public is an interesting thought. Um, and, but really I'm thinking like, if you think of the January 6th mob, one of the terrifying things, mobs are terrifying, just intrinsically terrifying. 
um, even if you're at it, they're terrifying because they're the type of crowd that's energized for violence. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing about this mob, and um, there, there are other mobs in history that have the same feature, is that they were enacting these violent acts as if they were the right, the rightful public. So there is a great set of interviews with some of the people who were at the Capitol on January 6th as part of this crowd and, and were interviewed. This was, came out in October in the New York Times. And, and, you know, you're like, and the reporter said, so, you know, can you explain why you think this is not an act of domestic terrorism, you know, breaking into Congress um, and breaking down these walls and windows and so on, um, fouling up the place. I'm like, well, this is our house. Mm -hmm. You know, we own it. This is not terrorism because we are the public. So the thought that you could have an experience of it, not in the sense of like a veridical experience, like a correct experience without an illusion, but you could have exp some experiences are illusions, like a preformationist having an illusion. You know, Jill is having an illusion. Um, but that doesn't stop it from seeming like perception. And that's part of what gives rise to the whole problem we were talking about earlier. So if you're in a mob, you know, some mobs will give you an illusion of this, just we are the public. Mm -hmm. or at least the rightful public. Um, and that's why we can do these things because you know the, our sovereignty is not a fiction. Our sovereignty is enacted right here, right now. So really it's a sense <clears throat> of political agency. And for people who've grown up hearing democracy is self-governance, what could feel more like self-governance than taking over the government building? You know, And so you could, I could see how somebody could kind of get in the frame of mind of like, this is me taking care of right. the country. You know, it's to them an act of patriotism. And I think it's really important to understand how it might be. I was not there on January 6th. I didn't uh, just use flash, you know, did not support. I didn't vote for Trump actually. And, you know, I didn't, they don't think the election was stolen. And if I did, I hope I wouldn't have like gone to do this political violent thing, which is the first time in US history, the first time in US history that there's been a nationwide mass movement using political violence um, for to try to overturn an election result or try to, you know, from their point of view, shape an election result. It doesn't matter which point of view you say it from. The point is that it's the first time there is a nationwide movement of political violence, um, you know, to deal with succession of government. Um, and so that's to me incredibly, um, you know, we, we should take note of that because it's, it's historically unprecedented in the US. Um, and, and it really calls for understanding on what are the people who were there who you know felt extremely like they they absolutely felt they deserved to be there and that they weren't as it says in the interviews with them you know it, they weren't doing domestic terrorism not at all you know mm -hmm. they were defending democracy they were patriots um, so I, this is an interesting case I think they were perceiving themselves as the public the rightful public like you know we are the ones who have a right to do these things because you know it's not like we're if you can compare it to a protest. We we're holding up a sign saying, stop the war. You know, I have a message. When if I'm a protester, I've got a message that I'm giving to somebody. Maybe mm -hmm. there'll be uptake, maybe there won't, but I'm giving a message. I'm not purporting to, you know, maybe I'd stop the war right here, here now if I could, but I can't. It's not for me to stop it. I don't have the power to stop it, though I would if I could. You know, that's the attitude of many protesters. Um, they're, but they're asking for something. They're making an appeal. Um, they're making an appeal. They're giving reasons for it, you know? Um, you know, maybe they're sort of very passionately given reasons, but they're reasons. And whereas the mob is not giving reasons, they're not making an appeal, they're not speaking to somebody, they're not communicating in this way that it's time to wait for an answer or anything like that. They're just doing it. They're just enacting it. It's just straight political agency. And I can see how that be incredibly appealing because it certainly solves, makes you feel a sense of political agency, which is otherwise very, very hard to feel. You can vote. That doesn't feel very agential. It takes a lot of time. Who knows what's going to happen? And it's just one vote after all. You know, you got to talk people into voting. Yeah. You know, of course, you also have to remove obstacles to it, but that's another thing. So, whereas like the mob, it really feels like it can feel like democratic political agency. I'm not saying it is that. I'm saying it's an illusion, right. but I am saying it can feel like that. So, yeah. I think that's an incredibly powerful social perception, the most powerful one I know. Um, and it's it, it shows that the standard view that you can't perceive the public is wrong. You can perceive the public. It's just that at least this way of doing it is full of illusions and danger. I think in one of your talks, you mentioned there was an intersectionality to that crowd too. So it's not, you know, uh, sort of a asymmetrical representation of the population. It was 
I think you were referring to people there. Yeah, exactly. So that enhances perhaps that solidarity of, you know, we're going to take back the power kind of thing. Yeah, that's really important. That's incredibly important. I mean, because if it was, if it had just been like a bunch of, you know, people in camouflage or whatever, you know, then it wouldn't, it would feel, it would feel, it would look much more like a coup. But this didn't, to them, feel like that. I believe that's what it was, or as they say in Spanish, auto golpe, an auto coup, because a coup is when you overturn a government, whereas this was to maintain a government. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's slightly different. But but yeah, there it was very. You would look around in that crowd. You see that the public has this intermediate scope between everybody and everybody you know. So it's intermediate between those two things. Um, and what can make it feel like you're in a crowd that has that intermediate scope is partly visible diversity, heterogeneity. Um, and that the January 6th crowd is incredibly heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. There were people who were Orthodox Jews. There were people who were, um, you know, who were anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. There were people who were in costumes. Now we've seen there are people who were not in costumes. There are men, there are women, there are older people, younger people. You know, there were all kinds of people there. It was a very diverse crowd of the US right, but it was a diverse crowd. <laughs> So from the people of, I, don't, I mean, maybe a little bit racially diverse, I don't have the numbers on that, um, but you know, look, there's all kinds of dimensions of diversity. And that's not, the, the point is that you could look around in that crowd and, and whoever you were, you would see people who didn't look like you in some way or other. You would see people who weren't like you in some way or other. And that gives a very powerful feeling of like, okay, look, we are it. And that's why they have those huge rallies. They have the huge rallies to generate exactly that feeling of like, as far as the eye can see, you know, they're open, they're, it's important that it's an open crowd. It's not sort of bounded by a specific building that has a, you know, a specific style or anything like that. That just makes it feel all the more like we are the, the people, it's the people who matter. Um, Patriots. The people who matter politically. <laughs> so yeah, it's a very powerful illusion. And if you think, as I do, that this was a profoundly anti-democratic thing, even though it was done under the banner of patriotism, if you think it was anti-democratic, then that raises a very important question, which is how could you, could you, and if so, how could you have experiences that are just as compelling, you know, but not anti-democratic? Is that possible or not? It's not clear that that's possible. Um, but if it's not possible, then, you know, you need some picturing, some, we need some vivid, compelling, immersive democratic practices. Um, otherwise, like all of the satisfactions of being in a crowd or in a mob are just going to be on that side. And that's, you know, good to explain the appeal, but we don't want to just sit here and explain the world. We want to sit here and make sure that there's not political violence inflicted against one another. Um, so that that takes some theorizing. And this has a nice um, uh, full circle back to uh, the, when we began with this, uh, this valid epistemic uh, charge, if you will, or presence that they, they felt this uh, justification, they felt this truth, this, and from their perspective, they were motivated by that. So again, mm -hmm. that po points out what you're saying, one of these problems that uh, epistemic thinkers deal with is that there are, there is epistemic value in what they did. But again, it's, 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 encapsulated in that thinking that was there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so I, I wonder, that, that's why I mentioned stigmergy earlier. It's like when you get several thousand people coming together, that's when I noticed the stigmergic process beginning that sort of um, decentralized yet organized um, flow or momentum uh, that mm -hmm. just, that just spurns up uh, spins up rather spontaneously and that was fascinating for, to watch and it happens every time you know there, uh, mm -hmm. the a football team could win the super bowl right. and they'll burn half the city down to celebrate so it's not exclusive yeah. to storming the capital it's it happens it every time we get you know charged up one way or another but we get into this flow state uh not the classic flow state but just this motion state uh yeah. with, with each other yeah which is fascinating and terrifying at the same time i guess it is yeah and it's long fascinated you know crowd theorists to figure out what what is the um seems it, there seems to be something about some types of crowds that have their own momentum have their own phenomenology have their own feeling so i, I think i'm very interested in the difference between the sort of post sports game violence which doesn't often get called a mob but it is <laughs> the same type of thing um versus the the mob with a political vision so the mob with a political vision that's the kind that will be perceiving the public whereas the the mob without a political vision wouldn't though so it's its own it's its own. There's a lot been written about why do people do that? Because usually the winners, 
you might think of like the losers are so mad and yeah. to break something, but no, it's usually when they win. <laughs> like yeah. you won, you know, but it's kind of like you want to extend it somehow. It's like, oh no, the game is over. And I don't have a good sort of first person experience of this because I, I don't normally go to like sports <laughs> games, but um, but you know, yeah, I'm interested in that in that phenomenon. Um, and you know, it's and like okay, you know, also because it's so important for civic unity, oftentimes these games that, you know, then when you have the extension of a celebration that actually becomes violent or overturns cars and burns stuff, you know, it's like in the, in terms of public discourse, it's like, yay, the team won. But, you know, Philadelphia is sort of famous for these, for this kind of making a huge mess. <laughs> and then if you sort of come out and you're the city leaders at this moment when like many people, maybe most people even are celebrating and then you're like, rah, 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 you know, it's sort of politically awkward or something. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't want to be the owner of any of those businesses that gets their like, you know, their 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 property They're, trashed or their windows yeah. broken because somebody's happy that somebody won a football game or, or hockey game or whatever it might be. So, yeah, that, that's a hard sell, right? That, to explain that to somebody. Yeah. Can't justify that at all. And and so you could de- you could scale it and reverse back down to the individual. And sometimes, and, and I'm guilty of this too. I'll I'll go and get uh, charged up and I'll do something to get some frustration out. And, and so, you know, I guess there's some of that involved too, that they're, you know, you have 15,000 people, they're happy, but they've got to release whatever it is. They're, you know, their existential, uh, detritus that's inside. You know? it's like maybe, maybe it's like, well, we're all together. We're drunk and we're really excited. It's what the hell, let's just burn the seat. Down, Cause it's going to feel great while we're doing it. We, there we, must be. Yeah. Yeah, it's also know. interesting that some of the people doing it would never do that on their own, that's you know, true. That's just, true. but like, and that, that's the sort of very old puzzle about crowd theory that some, some criminologists in the, um, you know, in the past centuries really wrung their hands about this of like, well, who really is responsible? Like if the person, if this individual would never do it, but you put them in a crowd and then they will do it, did they do it? Like, did they do it in a way that who is responsible if it's like yeah. they were swept up with this crowd? There is a lot of hand wringing about that for people who thought that, you know, if you think that all social phenomena are basically explicable in terms of what individuals do, but then you have group based phenomena where suddenly different things happen to groups. So what happens to individuals, you're not, it, it, it has its own level of, um, of momentum and explanation that, that uh, poses problems for like locating the responsibility, or some people have thought that. Yeah, yeah, because there aren't any organizers and uh, in those events, right. in those now you could find organizers mm-hmm. who you know were involved with the capital, but of course, again, you know when the when the Eagles win or the you know whoever Seahawks or whatever win a Super Bowl, that there's and again yeah. that's that's why I love the metaphor of stigma. It's just like this self organizing system that goes like a tornado mm-hmm. and does what it does, and everybody right. breaks away and and dogs do that too. Dogs, if you see dogs like a groups too. of dogs, they get all excited and and they yeah. get into this kind of group and they're social creatures like us. So it must be a, a holdover from our uh, from our coming up evolutionary uh growing up <laughs> which we haven't yeah. quite mastered yet but we're working on it so now i know you've mentioned a couple of times that you're uh working on a book on salience so do you want to wrap this up with your giving us a teaser about the future and and if you don't want to talk about the book but just maybe give some thoughts on salience or or is that interesting to you to to wrap it up that way sure um yeah i'm um I'm interested in, well, in a way, it's in some ways a sequel to the rationality perception. I have two different sequels to the rationality of perception. I'm not sure what order I'm doing them in. Um, okay. But but one, but yeah, the, but one sequel is about the kind of, I'm very interested in the spontaneous flow of thought. So mm. like we study the, in mental dynamics, the mental dynamics that are most, um, most frequently studied and they're best understood, although they're not understood perfectly, are association. So you know, you, you, your mind moves by association from like salt to pepper, just to take a very simple example, um, or uh, inference. But those are like just, too, you know, if, but now there's increasingly a little bit more research. My, my, one of my favorite researchers on this topic is Chandra Sripada from Michigan, um, you know, working on how, to, how you can characterize the spontaneous flow of thought. Mm-hmm. So, um, so in a conversation, um, an unscripted conversation is an example. The sort of thoughts you have that are kind of prompted by what the other person says. Um, so what are just what, first of all, what are even the determinants of the spontaneous flow of thought? Um, and, um, and where do we locate, you know, rationality? So, so that's how it's a similar question to the rationality perception, because in the rationality perception, I was arguing that this thing, perception, perceptual experience, which we're not used to thinking, at least in this tradition, we're not used to thinking of it as part of, you know, the 
domain of rationality actually is. Similarly, I think some of these transitions in the spontaneous flow of thought are similarly susceptible to, um, okay. you know, showing um, it. So, uh, so even though, even when they're not association and even when they're not inference, well, people think association in general isn't rationally available, accessible. Um, but even, but uh, yeah, but you could have a third thing that's just the movement of one, you know, the movement from one thought to the next, but it's not, you know, necessarily um, the result of associative learning, um, but it's also not an inference, but can we find, can we find, um, can we find uh, rationality there? So actually I can illustrate this with something we talked about earlier, which is, um, you know, if, if you feel that you're a subject that you could at any time be subject to this kind of interpersonal domination in public space, which was a kind of hallmark of Jim and Jane Crow hmm. and has a kind of leftover in relationships between, you know, police officers and, and people who are kind of over, over policed or vulnerable to police abuses or experience themselves as so vulnerable, um, which is sort of a race class interface, I think. Um, um, then, then this is a similar kind of experience moving through the world of like, I may be vulnerable to this domination that, you know, someone could abuse me with impunity. And, and knowing that that could happen changes how you will see what their possibilities are. Um, and the same way that like a pessimist or an optimist, but it's easier to illustrate pessimism. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're sort of pessimistic about just in general, if you're like Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh, um, you know, the way the world shows up to you is gonna, um, the way the world shows up to you is going to be congruent with your pessimism. Um, so, um, I'm interested in, in examples of the spontaneous flow of thought that might reflect, you know, one of these standing states like pessimism or looking, needing to look for refuge or something. Um, so, uh, and then I'm thinking that those, those transitions might, might be just as, th those transitions tell us much more. They're not just sort of blank transitions. Um, those transitions are, you know, moments where we can see people's, sometimes people's character, sometimes just people's concerns, sometimes people's reasonableness. Um, Another example is like, you know, if you think about newspapers, I'm very interested. I taught this course in the philosophy of journalism last semester, and that was great. I'm really enjoying this topic. Um, but, you know, a newspaper selects, a newspaper selects information and decides to publish, you know, certain stories. And then within a story, mm. crafts a story out of certain facts that it's weaving a narrative out of. But there's lots of facts you could choose, and there's lots of stories you could choose, but the editor makes these decisions, and so does the writer. So I'm thinking the mind is kind of like a newspaper mm. in that, like, it selects. Um, you know, it selects things in the environment to focus on, um, and, um, and we don't have any problem seeing selection in the case of a newspaper as reflecting uh, some outlooks that are more or less reasonable. So similarly, in the case of the mind, you know, we tend to think like, well, if I just pay attention to this turtle, like, oh my god, I noticed the turtle. Like, that's not sort of an inference, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's not the kind of thing that seems it could be epistemically better or worse. But I think kind of writ large, if you look at what the mind selects to focus on, you know, you can see something a little bit like a newspaper in that, like, well, what, you, what the pessimist selects to focus on, you yeah, know, could yeah. be a function of the pessimism. And if their pessimism is reasonable, great. And if their pessimism is exaggerated, then maybe the selection itself. Um, there is actually a chapter floating this idea in the rationality perception. So that's how it makes it a kind of um, sequel. So oh, anyway, okay. whatever. I haven't even known it yet. <laughs> but that's uh, that's potentially on the horizon, and uh, that's great. It's so it'll be almost it'll be a trilogy then, right? If you do so. get get to yeah, the the Susanna yeah. Siegel trilogy. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Well, I'm lo I'm looking forward to reading more of your books. It seems like there's this, you know, there's always this Bayesian variable hanging out, like like you were saying in spontaneity of conversation. But there are these things that can, you know, either preloaded in our psychology or like you right. said, mapping. Uh, while we're having a spontaneous conversation for cues, perhaps. So it's fascinating to really, again, a, a street level naive like perception is to me is like we all, I think, unless, you know, someone like you that studies this, that we just think we take it for granted. In other words, that what we see is what is happening. It's a one to one right. mapping of this world that yeah. we inhabit. And it's, it, yeah. it's vastly more, uh, not vastly more complex, but it is much more complex than we give it credit for. <laughs> Again, it just is. at the intuitive street level. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. another good reason to uh, to study this and to look in, into uh, how we perceive the world. And I think what you did is uh, is a wonderful contribution to that. Again, given my limited grasp and apprehension of <laughs> of some of the more technical stuff, but I got the gist of it, and I think it's really. Did. I'm, I, I'm, 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 
honored and, and pleased that you that you found something in it. Yeah, I did. I did. And it inspired me so much so that I reached out to you to see if we could have this conversation. And I am uh, very grateful that we did. And I am even better informed uh, by what you have uh, been presenting both in the book and, and uh, for those watching, uh, there's, there's content on YouTube uh, where she talks about this in just different angles and with different people. So, um, so you can get that. And I will make sure that all relevant information to uh, find Professor Siegel's work. Uh, she has a website and she has social media. And and that'll all be down in the description field. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank the uh, YouTube uh, viewers who are still watching with us. Sometimes we get, I usually get down to about 10%. So if this gets a few hundred views and we had 50 people <laughs> that hung in with us to the end, and I'm always deeply grateful to yeah. you guys for, for sticking it out because you, you're, you're curious and you're, you're, you want to know more. So, so much, much thanks to you guys. And again, Professor Siegel, thank you so much for taking the time to have a conversation thank with you. Justin. You. I'll say goodbye to you after we stop record, but I just want to thank you uh, for, for this okay, conversation. It's a real pleasure. All right. So I'll stop recording. We'll say goodbye and, and goodbye, you two people. <laughs>